listen to God's word as it comes to us from the book of Genesis, chapter 25, verses 19 through 34. Listen to God's word. These are the descendants of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah, daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean of Paddan Aram, sister of Laban, the Aramean. Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord granted his prayer, and his wife Rebekah conceived. The children struggled together within her, and she said, if it is to be this way, why do I live? So she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb, and two peoples born of you shall be divided. One shall be stronger than the other, the elder shall serve the younger. When her time to give birth was at hand, there were twins in her womb. The first came out red, all his body like a hairy mantle, so they named him Esau. Afterwards, his brother came out with his hand gripping Esau's heel, so he was named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when Rebekah bore them. When the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man living in tents. Isaac loved Esau because he was fond of game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Once when Jacob was cooking a stew, Esau came in from the field and was famished. Esau said to Jacob, let me eat some of that red stuff, for I am famished. Therefore, he was called Edom. Jacob said, first, sell me your birthright. Esau said, I am about to die. Of what use is this birthright to me? Jacob said, Swear to me first. So Esau swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. So then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and drank and rose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. This is the word of our God. Thanks be to God. Genesis is really full of doozies, isn't it? I will say Genesis is actually one of the books of the Hebrew scriptures that I truly enjoy and from which I enjoy preaching most. Yet there are many sermons in any one text, as I like to say, and this complicated passage is just one. So as we Reflect on this word together. Let us first pray. Gracious and loving God, your word reminds us continually that you are God and we are not, that your ways are not our ways, that your love has no end. And so we pray that in this moment and always, You will draw near to us and open our eyes and our ears and our hearts and our minds and all of our senses to your word for us. And may the words of my mouth and the meditation on all of our hearts be acceptable to you, O God, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. In this day and age, all it takes is a Google search to learn things I have never known about my own flesh and blood. Now this is not only all that can be found out by logging on to Ancestry.com, as many of us have, 
But a Google search can tell me that my body is made up of more than 30 trillion cells. And of those cells, there are about 200 different types of cell, each cell beautifully designed for the work that is necessary for my survival. Now, what's more, every second, my body produces 25 million new cells, and every month, my body replaces the entire surface of my skin. And these are not just facts about my body alone. They are ours, even with differences and nuances, with strengths and limitations, our bodies are indeed fearfully and wonderfully made. Now, while I find and share these facts with amazement, the truth is that that which I know most about my own body is that I have one. I occupy one. I am one. I experience this world and all of the relationships I have with others and with creation through this five foot two and a half frame <laughs> that hasn't grown an inch taller since I was 12. I claim that half an inch. I walk on the same little size feet as my grandma Tani and my aunt Helen. And I blame my need for bifocals on the fact that I read so many books by nightlight, after bedtime, as a child. My big rebellion as a kid. My next biggest one was becoming a Protestant. Um, my body has grown and birthed and nursed another person. My body has supported and cared for and held the hand of those who were dying as they transitioned from this life to the next. My body has surprised me. It has learned dance moves. It has planted rhododendron and typed with precision. My body has frustrated me. It has required surgeries and physical therapy, and it has suffered more than one broken toe. My body has inspired me, and my body has let me down. It has made messes, cleaned messes, and at times felt like a mess altogether. Now, it has been argued, perhaps by those who have ex expounded upon the teachings of Paul, adding dimension to the text he wrote that perhaps was not entirely there, that flesh itself is nothing more than the gateway to sin. There are those who have argued that our sensory systems do little more than open to us a world of passions and impossible choices, compelling us to chase after pleasure rather than submit to the will of God. I'm sorry for the feedback. I hear it too. Flesh has become, for many, synonymous for all that would pull us away from the will of God. The tradition of Christian history has advanced this thinking. We, who gather and worship today, bear the marks of ancient Greek dualistic thinking and 20th century purity culture, which has origins in centuries before. We superimpose these ideals onto the Bible itself and look for clues that suggest that the body is bad and the spirit is good, as if we, God's people, are nothing more than that. Now, I hate to say it, but I just don't buy it. See, bodies aren't messy, they are complex, and they can indeed enact choices that bring harm to others, but they are beautiful, intricate, and they can enact choices that extend compassion and justice and care to others. 
Barbara Brown Taylor says it better than I could, and she writes, however differently you and I may conceive the world, God or one another, physical reality is something we can usually agree on. When the temperature drops below 32 degrees, I am as cold as the person who ever, as whoever happens to be standing next to me. When I see someone run into a piece of furniture, catching the corner of a table right in the thigh, my own thigh hurts in the exact same place. When I am sitting next to someone in a meeting and our stomachs growl at the same time, we both shift in our seats, unable to ignore a connection more fundamental than knowing each other's names. My body is what connects me to all of these other people. Wearing my skin is not a solitary practice, but one that brings me into communion with these other embodied souls. Now it is through our bodies that we too gain access to the ancient text that we read for today. Now in these verses, we get an origin story for one of the patriarchs of faith, Jacob, the child of promise through whom God will continue to create God's people. We hear of two babies, twin brothers, trying to outdo and undo each other even before they are born. A womb that was barren for decades is filled not only with new life, but with conflict. And we learn that Rebecca has learned that she will give birth not only to two sons, but to two nations. Now, anyone who has felt the pain of infertility or the pain of a baby's kick from the inside can imagine Rebecca's surprise and her concern when she feels a drama playing out within her own body. We read even of two babies traveling through the birth canal in rapid succession the younger brother refusing to be left behind, clinging firmly to his brother's foot. Before we learn much about Jacob the patriarch, we learn about Jacob the brother, Jacob the son, favored by his mother, dismissed by his dad at constant odds with his womb mate. Jacob plays the long game, even when it includes the tactics of lying or deceit or capitalizing on the weakness and vulnerability of others. All right, I do not tell my child to act like Jacob. I tell my child over and over and over again that I actually do not care about much of who he becomes. I don't care about his job. I don't care about his success. I don't care about his aspirations. I mean, I care. Who, who am I kidding? I'm his mom. But I, but I don't care about who he is or who he chooses to be as long as he is kind. He knows the statement so well, he fills in the blank when I leave that sentence unspoken. My expectation of him is kindness. That is my hope for my son. But even as I critique Jacob's actions and Rebecca's and Esau's, I also would be remiss if I don't name that the societal dynamics of their day doesn't afford Rebecca the same luxury that I have to insist that my own child focus on kindness. For she had to nurture Jacob to be shrewd so that he and consequently herself would be guaranteed greater security in the future ahead. A future in which she, as a woman, had no say and Jacob, as a second born, had little inheritance to receive. Isaac and Esau had societal placement that assured their security. But Rebecca knew 
that she and Jacob needed a plan B. And so we read in these 15 verses of the Bible, of Hebrew scripture, a story of favoritism and lies. We learn that one brother desires long-term gain and the other instant gratification. We see one brother manipulating for power, the other callously surrendering his birthright for a pot of stew. And yet, as we read their story in scripture, and as we shake our heads and tisk our tongues, we are told these are God's people. These are the ones through whom God is going to enact God's covenant. These are the people through whom God will create nations and the one through whom God's beloved chosen people will be born. These people. Messy, sinful, imperfect, with bodies that fail them one moment and bodies that come through. These are God's people, hungry, hardworking, looking for their fill. These are God's people, complicated, flesh and blood, just like us. Now, I am not so sure what I think about the fact that God works through people like Jacob. There is a part of me that is truly much more comfortable witnessing God's promise enacted and God's righteousness made known on display through the righteousness of God's people. For those who easily give up their seat to another so they might sit down. For those who surrender their own bottle of water so another will have a drink. That's easier for me to digest in some ways as I try to make good choices and follow through on promises and try to do my best to live as God might like. It's motivating. It's palatable. It makes sense in my brain and easier for us in this world to identify the helpers and the heroes among us. But God continues to do God's faithful work through people like Jacob and Rebecca and Abram, who himself was as problematic as they come. God continues to work through those who sin. God continues to work through those who look out for themselves and forget about others, whether out of greed or convenience. And in fact, God does it all the time. God works through prophets who try to run from God's call. And I don't even name one prophet because they all do it. And disciples, God works through disciples who bicker about which one of them deserves a seat of honor in heaven. God chooses followers from among tax collectors and fishermen, and then God sends Samaritan women and former demoniacs to go into the world and proclaim the gospel. This is what God does. And I suppose just as this fact makes me uncomfortable, it is also a fact, or dare I say a pattern, that gives me hope. For God continues to show up in the humanness of God's people. God shows up in us. God even goes so far as to put on flesh and blood in Jesus Christ, occupying both a womb and a grave, finding pleasure in a shared meal and a good glass of wine and a solid night's sleep experiencing suffering and death on a cross. God works upon. God works through the mess and the beauty and the potential and the limits of human lives as if God is trying to tell us something about ourselves that we don't even know. Barbara Brown Taylor writes, what many of us miss is that our bodies remain God's best way of getting to us.
It has been suggested that our bodies are more than gateways to sin. Perhaps, as Taylor suggests, they are, in fact, the instruments through which we experience God, the world, and one another. Perhaps they are the tools through which we can know the fullness of God's grace and mercy, redemption and love, and perhaps they are the instruments through which God sends us into the world to bear the good news to others too. Thomas Merton writes this, All over the face of the earth, The avarice and lust of people breed unceasing divisions among them. And the wounds that tear humanity from union with one another widen and open out into huge wars. But, but as long as we are on earth, the love that unites us will bring us into contact with one another. Because this love is the resetting of a body of broken bones. Barbara Brown Taylor goes on to put it like this. Wearing my skin is not a solitary practice, but one that brings me into communion with all of these other embodied souls. It is what we have most in common with one another. In Christian teaching, followers of Jesus are called to honor the bodies of our neighbors as we honor our own. In his expanded teaching by example, this includes leper bodies, possessed bodies, widow and orphan bodies, as well as foreign bodies and hostile bodies, none of which he shied away from. Read from the perspective of the body, his ministry was about encountering those whose flesh was discounted by the world in which they live. The story of Jacob reminds us that God is a God who works through impossible odds and through impossible people to do impossible things. The story of Jacob assures us that the faithfulness of God is not only at work upon and through the flesh and blood of the patriarchs and matriarchs, but that God's self dons flesh and blood and shows us that we are to live out this love too. Friends, we gather to worship a living God, a God who put on flesh to dwell among us, a God who not only called each one of us children, but claimed us as God's own body. May we, in our imperfection and our limits, may we, in our hopes and our prayers, May we as individuals and as God's people trust and place our hope in a God who came to us in Christ to show us that through Christ all things are possible. May the love of God, the community of the Holy Spirit, and the grace of Jesus Christ be made known through us and our bodies too. May we grow closer to one another and to the stranger. May we dare to get to know someone who is different from us. And may we experience the love of God friends and family, because God is faithful even when we're not. May it be so. Amen.